Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. We'll likely have more people trickling in um, throughout the presentation and throughout the day, but I think we'll get started now so that we can stay on time for the, the future sessions. Um, so good afternoon and welcome to the opening session of the 2017 Sustaining Peace Forum. I'm Josh Fisher and I'm the director of the Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict and Complexity at the Earth Institute. The Sustaining Peace Forum is an annual event sponsored by AC4, as we're known, um, at the Earth Institute. And the forum's an opportunity to extend AC4's mission of sustaining peace through innovation. For those who, not, who may not be yet uh, part of our network, we're a consortium of programs and centers across Columbia that work to create a hub for the important work on peace, conflict, and sustainable development done around the university. We provide a range of services to students and scholars around Columbia, uh, including things like fellowships for research, networking and support services, coordination services, um, and we lead collaborative research, collaborative interdisciplinary research in four areas. Sustainable Peace, led by Professor Peter Coleman, who's the director of the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution. Women, Peace and Security, led by Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Lema Bowie. Youth Peace and Leadership, led by Dr. Beth Fisher Yoshida, who's the director of the master's program in negotiation and conflict resolution. And Environment, Peace and Security, which I lead. Through the Sustaining Peace Forum, each year we bring together a, a unique program of speakers, scientists, policy experts, and leaders in innovation to explore the question of how to make our world more just, more peaceful, and ultimately more sustainable. And the Sustaining Peace Forum is grounded in three ideas. First, that de sustainable development cannot be realized without lasting peace in a world free from destructive conflict. In other words, peace is a mechanism for sustainable development. Second, that peace cannot be realized without just institutions, the pursuit of well-being for our societies and our ecosystems, and respect and equality for all people. In other words, sustainable development is a mechanism that fosters sustainable peace. And third, that sustainable, peaceful development is a collaborative pursuit. It requires the participation, the ownership, and the shared vision of many stakeholders. And based on that idea, we're grateful to have the co-sponsorship of many critical partners across Columbia, including the Master's Program in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution, the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution, the Earth Institute, the Center on Global Economic Governance, and the Tamer Center for, for Social Enterprise. So this year's forum explores sustainable peace from four distinct perspectives. <coughs> First, peace, mountains, and borders, the role that geography and space play in conflict and conflict resolution. Next, how global movements on peace social justice uh, can inform US-based activists. Next, how to laugh, the role of comedy in social justice and sustainable peace. And finally, the global implications of the refugee crisis. In the current global and domestic climate, these topics are more pressing than ever. So on behalf of our co-sponsors and the brilliant panelists and presenters from, a, from our program, I wanna thank you all for demonstrating your commitment to creating a more just, a more peaceful, and a more sustainable world by being here today. I hope that many or all of you can stay for all of the panels. Um, individually, each session, each session presents important ideas to advance peace and enable conflict resolution in such trying times. Collectively, however, they present a well-rounded vision of some of the challenges that we face and strategies and opportunities to continue working toward a more peaceful world. If you're not able to stay for the entire forum today, I hope you'll be able to join us this evening for a reception um, that'll serve as a networking forum, where we hope we'll be able to foster many conversations that will lead to productive partnerships going forward. So with that, I'd like to welcome our first panel on peace, mountains, and borders to come to the, to the fore. And I'd like to welcome my colleague Aldo Civico, who's a Rutgers University assistant professor an associate research scientist at AC4 to introduce and MC our first panel for the 2017 Sustaining Peace Forum. Thank you.
Thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming, showing up, for skipping lunch, probably, <laughs> and uh, coming to our panel. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to kick off the fifth edition of this uh, forum. And we are also uh, excited to celebrate the publishing of Judith's uh, book, uh, No Friends But the Mountains, that inspired our panel. So congratulations on this important milestone. Um, and, you know, I, I cannot start by not also mentioning and remembering that we witnessed yesterday, at least in the Western world, one more violent attacks that, that questions really uh, our, our times and, and uh, I think also puts questions and challenges to our field of uh, uh, conflict resolution as it seems that the landscape of conflict uh, and, uh, and the peaks are uh, skyscrapers and and the urban areas together with uh, uh, the scenarios that Judith uh, presents in, uh, in the book. Um, so I think that the relationship between the rural, the urban, the mountains, and the urban in today's uh, complex world are going to be increasingly interesting to, to look at in order for us uh, in this emerging future to find a solution to conflicts. Let me just uh, briefly um, introduce uh, our panelists. I'm just mentioning them with some highlights, but in the programs you have a more extended uh, biography. I uh, start here with uh, Judith Matlov. Uh, she is a very senior and experienced journalist, uh, worked for very important uh, media like uh, Reuters, the New York Times Magazine, uh, the Christian Science Monitors reporting from uh, uh, Warrington areas and is now a professor of journalism at Columbia University. At the end of the table, uh, we have Professor Dipali Mukopat Yai. I don't know if I'm, perfect. is it perfect? Great, yeah. almost perfect. Uh, she is also author of a, a wonderful book, uh, World's Strong Men, Governors and State Building. Uh, her research has been uh, focused on Afghanistan and more recently on the Syrian civil war. Uh, this morning she actually remembered me that we met at the border between Turkey and uh, Syria while we were both working on conflict resolution in that area. Um, and then uh, Paul Gillingham, who is an historian of modern Mexico and, uh, and an author. His latest book is uh, Dic uh, Dicta Blanda, Politics, Work, and Culture in Mexico, 1938-1968. And um, uh, he's an expert on political history of revolution in Mexico and political violence in, in, in a democracy. Um, you know, the format will be that we start with Judith uh, because her book gave us the opportunity of excuse uh, for this panel. So, so that uh, uh, we speak about uh, your own experience and findings and conclusions about the book, and then we will have uh, uh, other two panelists, and then uh, we uh, uh, want to have uh, time for a Q and A for this uh, panel. So, we, we talk about in this panel, we talk about peace, we talk about mountains, and we talk about borders. And when I uh, saw uh, Judith's book and, and the title of the panel, I was reminded of uh, my own experience while I was doing uh, ethnographic work in Colombia uh, on the paramilitaries, the death squads in Colombia. And, and, and I was in a <laughs> coca growing area, uh, which is a mountain uh, region part of Colombia. And, uh, and I had a paramilitary just uh, as a guide showing me the coca growing fields um, and, and the chain of production of cocaine. And at one point, he stops me and asks me, but do you have mountains in the United States? Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand the question. I said, yes, we, we, we have mountains. Oh, he says, so you have war as well. Mm -hmm. And that for me was very interesting because his experience of mountains, of course, was the violence, was being uh, 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 yeah, a member of the paramilitaries and fighting the, the, the war in, and the violence in, in Colombia. And then I told him, no, you know, we actually... You know, we do, we do hiking, we go to skiing, we, we go weekends, uh, that's right. And, and he was looking at me like I was talking about a different planet, right? And I realized, you know, um, well, unless he will have a different experience at some point with the geography, with the mountains, how can he Im even imagine, envision something different than the experience he grew up with, right? So it, it became so plastic for me how geography and the landscape and the experience that we have shapes also our perception of, of reality. 
And you know, I thought that maybe my grandfather would have responded the same during World War II when, when he, with a group of uh, uh, friends in the Alps where I grew up skiing, but where he actually you know, fought against Hitler and, and, and Nazism by creating an insurgency group, partisans group, and, and, and freeing a valley in Austria, uh, you know, in Tyrol, which is a part of a, uh, you, you write about the, uh, in, in the book. Uh, and, and so how many times the mountains are becoming also a symbol, a metaphor, you know, or a myth of, of resistance, uh, of fight, you know, of conquer, and how much that is ingrained in our in the histories of several countries and parts of the of the uh, world. So you know, this is what we want to talk about somehow: the relationship between the geography and the violence, and how that shapes also our imagination. And, and, and you know, for for the violence, but also maybe for an emerging future that uh, doesn't count with uh, with the weapons. So, um, Judy, I'd like to start with you um, and just ask you. You know, how did you come about with this idea, with the book, especially on, on focusing on, on mountains? And what did you discover by going across the world and, and meeting all these mountains and the people living in those mountains? Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> um, it, the way I came up with the idea is actually so prosaic. It was in my living room, my, my dining room in New York City, about 20 blocks north of here. Um, the men in my family love to play the board game Risk. I would presume, I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads, a lot of people here would play Risk. I hate the game, but they love it. And in my family, it goes on for days and days and days. And we were playing, my son, my husband, and I were playing Risk, and we were like five hours into it. And my husband pretty much had Afghanistan under his, under his belt. And my son decided that we needed a break to distract dad. So he turned to me and he said, Mom, what conflict areas have you worked in? So I brought a globe, and I said, here, here, here. And he would put his finger on all of them, and he said, Mom, these are all mountains. And that's because I'd worked in Chechnya, I'd worked in Mexico, I'd worked in Colombia. And then the penny dropped. Then he said, why? And I said, well, I don't have an answer, but this sounds like a good book. So that's how it began. <laughs> um, and then I, after that, I spent about um, eight years traveling over 72 thousand miles over five continents going to various places Nepal and Kashmir and Colombia, Mexico, the Basque country. Um, Albania, um, to, to figure out if there was anything really uniting these. And the, the answer is so basic and obvious, and yet I think it doesn't really occur to us, which is the, you know, these are cut off islands in the sky, and there's both physical isolation as well as um, psychological. And these neighborhoods are just, these neighborhoods, these communities are just so caught up that they're not integrated economically, politically, and culturally into the mainstream culture. And usually the only time that central government gets involved or corporations is when they want to extract resources. But for the most part, these, these are very, very neglected areas. These are the worst, the last places where schools and clinics and roads are built. And... It, they're also a perfect place for people to hide. I mean, these are the lands of the poppy growers and, you know, the sanctuaries of bandits and jihadists and, and revolutionaries. So, um, in a nutshell, that would be what I found. But, and, but what I did find, which was interesting, is also a, a very similar psychology. Um, a resentment of the flatlands, a sense of being cut off and not being um, treated with respect and dignity. And that was something almost universal. Yeah, you know, uh, while I was listening to you, I, I, I was recently in, in Colombia. In Colombia, because of the peace process, you have now concentration of uh, guerrilla members in certain areas. Most of them are mountain areas where they stayed, really abandoned communities where there was no, exactly what you said, you know, where no services, no education. No. And of course, they are setting up these camps for, uh, for the demobilization and disarmament process. So they're bringing electricity, they're bringing water, they're bringing a lot of services, right? But it's only for a certain period of time during the disarmament, uh, the concentration and disarmament of the, of the FARC uh, uh, troops. And mountain communities are getting very angry uh, with the national government because we say, well, you're setting up now, finally we have lights and finally we have, you know, you know uh, uh, infirmary and, and all of that. And then in mid-May, you're going to take this all, uh, all away just because the FARC is demobilizing going away, right? So it, it shows how, which is something that you touch upon in the book, it shows how difficult sometimes it, it is also for the central state, you know, for the, for the government, for the state to imagine 
uh, what life looks like really in everyday life up in the, up in, up in the mountains. Yeah, and I mean, one thing that I found in Albania was that, um, and elsewhere, is that blood feuds largely persist in mountain communities. You know, in the most part, you know, when it's a flatland, more integrated community, you'll have more modern forms of justice. But in these cut-off communities where there's no Facebook, where there are no phones, where there are no police stations, oftentimes these very archaic, biblical age forms of justice will continue. Um, so, indeed... So, so in, in the book you mentioned also that for us that are in the spirit of ana analyzing this conflict, we speak a lot about or we write a lot about north and south, east and west, but not really about high and low. Um, and, and we touch upon also a lot about challenges and how geography might be represent a difficulty. If you, if you think in terms of opportunities, how, how would you this high and low indicate as an opportunity for peace in, uh, rather than for fragmentation, for, for war, for... I, well, I think if you look at the Basque country, um, by I, th I think what you have to accept is that if you have very cut off communities, and they're oftentimes minority groups, they could be indigenous or they're minority language groups, it's going to be very hard to integrate them, both culturally as well as physically. So. Uh, I think one of the best models is some form of autonomy, to just accept that people have a different way of life and to give them power over their own lives. And um, you know, if you look at the Basque country, for instance, I, I think the Spanish government was really clever because what they did is they weakened and diluted ETA, the, the armed separatists, to such an extent by basically granting de facto um, autonomy and pouring in economic resources. And you know, the, it took 50 years for the movement to end, but it's over now, pretty much. And I think the the if you look at public opinion polls over the years, as the area's um, de facto autonomy set root, people were less likely to turn to violence. And and uh, you, a different context of mountains you presented was Switzerland. Uh, do you want to talk about what, what you yeah saw there? when when people look at the table contents you know Nepal you know well you know the Balkans uh, Chechnya Dagestan Switzerland <laughs> what is that doing here but you know what we tend to forget is that for a very long period of time Switzerland exported mercenaries they were very very they were known for their fighting ability and they would be um, they would they would export their soldiers to kings across and kingdoms throughout Europe. And look, you know, they're still the Vatican Guard. But until only about 180 years ago, they were rent apart by civil war and civil strife. And what the, what the government, the, the new government did there was, I think, very clever. And it would be a great model for other areas if um, other countries would accept it, which is they didn't try to impose one national identity. They said, OK, we're going to have four language groups. We're going to have two religious groups. And we're going to give enormous amount of direct democracy and control to the 62 cantons, which are basically mountain, very you know, separated from each other valleys. And you know, it, it, the direct democracy is such there that a citizen like any of us could get enough signatures to, to call a referendum to change the constitution. And each canton has immense control financially and politically over their own affairs. And I, I, I think it would be, is it realistic? No. <laughs> but it would be a great solution for isolated communities to not try to impose the, the mainstream culture, but just to accept that people have their own way of doing things and give them that control. Excellent. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Um, and I understand that the book is for sale at the end of the yes, uh, event. Yes, and right. I can sign it if you want. Great. Uh, Paul, let's, let's talk about Mexico. And, um, when we talk about landscape, we talk about mountains and borders. Um, how does that look? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities in, in Mexico? Well, as Judith pointed out, mountains um, correlate very closely with violence. And this really is... Um, very much the case across Latin America. And if you start at the border with the US in the Western Sierra of Chihuahua and follow mountain change all the way down to the end of Chile, um, you have a long string of historical conflicts. Um, in Mexico, um, mountains have been the site of conflicts and the revolution started actually up there in the western Sierra of Chihuahua. The most recent revolution was in the highlands of Chiapas. And the reason is that 
mountains are the sort of last refuge historically for the marginalized and the impoverished. And you have, in that case, marked problems when you have development. Because development generally presupposes taxes. Development presupposes a decline in autonomy. And so over and over again in Mexican history, actually mountain men have been very happy being left alone. And it's when that relationship starts to change and a state turns up and charges taxes and takes over resources and ousts local politicians, it's then that you have problems. And the difficulty, of course, is that people in mountains tend to be very good at violence. They've got lots of practice and they've got, quite literally, the upper hand. So w when, when you hear Judith uh, talking about Switzerland or this, you know, recognizing and giving autonomy and, and self-determination if you want to these mountain communities, and you think about Mexico, what, what, do you, what, what do you see possible, what has been working, you know, uh, Chiapas has been trying to do that now for, for some time. Um, what, what's your response? What is your idea about that? Well, there's going back um, 60 or 70 years, it's called Usos y Costumbres, which is a sort of constitutional pick, pick and mix, whereby the center state surrendered autonomy on sort of fuzzy grounds of indigenous majorities to some uplands in Oaxaca, more recently effectively in Chiapas. Um, the problem is it tends to be half the equation. You get the autonomy, but you don't necessarily get development, the Basque model, which really is the handmaiden for sustainable peace. They get half of it. That half is not lasting. And, you know, another factor, as you're talking about Mexico, um, is the fact that today, yes, there are these communities that are very local. Um, they might also have these forms of resistance that are linked and rooted in local history. But they come together today with a more transnational reality, which are also the transnational networks uh, of crime that use also those communities and that geography in, in actually to, to, to further their, their business and, uh, and their criminal business. So I was wondering if you could speak about that with respect to, to, uh, to, to Mexico. You know, where is the intertwinement between the violence that comes from transnational networks of crime and, and a violence that might be more expression of a political um, protest, a political resistance? In a, in political, in a violence that is politically motivated. Certainly. Well, the next mountainous conflict down after the sort of birthplace of the revolution is the high, highlands of Sinaloa, which is really the birthplace of the modern industrial drugs trade. This is the home of the eponymous cartel. And there you have a quite simple equation of autonomy, fostering peace, as long as the government stayed out. Once again, you have a problem with the wrong, in inverted commas, sort of intervention. There was a stable modus vivendi, enabling drugs to flow north from these highlands. For decades, it was broken in the early north. Since then, we've had 100,000 deaths, 20x thousand disappearances, etc. And so once again, you can take the drugs trade as an example of the twin-edged sword of autonomy and the transnational networks and without them there would be no drug trade in this case for the simple reason that Mexico isn't really a drug consuming society. WHO figures have it really towards the bottom of global drug consumption. So this is an example of generalizing the arrival of capitalism to isolated mountain communities with resources having catastrophic effects. And, and so you would still think that adding development to this area could be affecting also uh, those transnational networks of, uh, of crime? Or That's a very good question, and it's an extremely difficult one to answer for the simple reason that you need a massive tax base or massive amounts of foreign aid to make the calculus of growing alternative crops actually add up. In Afghanistan, for example, I think that farm gate prices, it's three times as profitable to grow poppy. And in the most, I think, enlightening datum I've ever come across, in terms of sort of motivation for people to grow or not grow 
um, poppies, drugs in general. Um, there was a survey where the only really valid reason, the powerful one, was religion, a moral prohibition. Because on basic economic terms or political terms, rational choice dictates that you cultivate drugs. So a cultural element, basically, lever leveraging something that is latent in, in, in a society and, and that could put things in a different direction. I think it's going back to, you know, the, the only um, powerful prohibition is cultural rather than economic. But the economic rationale for growing is stronger. exceptionally strong. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Paul. And, and, and I think that leads us nicely or, or, or challengingly <laughs> into uh, uh, Afghanistan, which is probably one of the mountain regions we got to know mostly through the media, the mainstream media, and, and giving an idea how, how difficult it is for a counterinsurgency effort, uh, but also for uh, a nation state in traditional terms to, to be formed. I know you have a Yeah, you know what, but I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna sit here okay. actually. I, cool. I think it's it fits actually well with the comments that have been made. Yeah, I, I like I love this image of cut off islands in the sky. I think this is very evocative of what people often think about when they think about Afghanistan as you know, not I mean this metaphor of low and high is very relevant, and it makes me think of Jim Scott's work on, right, the way that people use the mountains as a way to escape the state. And so in Afghanistan, I think the, the challenge for any ruler, which is the perspective from which, you know, I've been looking at this, is to think about what kind of influence can, whether it's low to high or in the way that I tend to think about it spatially as center to periphery, what kind of influence can the center actually exert over the periphery? And it's interesting to think about Judith's um, solutions. And I was actually born in Switzerland, and so this is an interesting c comparison to make between Switzerland and Afghanistan. The, the Afghan state has been designed sort of in the reverse, which is a highly centralized design. And the idea was... And this has been for quite some time that rulers could use the power of appointments um, in order to exert leverage at the periphery. So there are now 34 provinces that we could describe as the, as the periphery of the state. And the president has the authority to send individuals to each province and then move them around. And so for me, uh, when I think about, you know, how what sort of strategies are there or what sort of instruments of rule are there by which to manage conflict or to manage competition or violent competition. One of them is this idea of using a certain kind of patronage politics that we tend to associate with corruption and cronyism and bad governance, but that in fact, you know, in my first book project on Afghanistan, I was looking at uh, warlords who became governors and understanding the way, again, in which actors that had a tremendous amount of power at the periphery or in the mountains, literally sometimes and metaphorically other times, how could that power be harnessed on behalf of the government um, and the idea of government? And were there certain circumstances in which that could actually be something that looked like either conflict management or conflict resolution or even something that looks like state building or the emergence of, of state authority. And so I think the challenge is that though the logics by which a regime is trying to assert influence at the periphery, they don't always align with our conceptions of what governing should look like. And they, you know, one of the things that I'm interested in is understanding what, is, what are the clashes between or the differences between the logic by which a particular government, like the Karzai government, would approach governing at the periphery versus the way in which Western counterinsurgency do doctrine might imagine it, which is each pocket of the periphery matters and becomes of great strategic import so that a given district in the south or a valley in the east must be captured. Public services must be brought there. And this is very, this is not in keeping with this idea of letting 
letting certain spaces be and letting them evolve. And so I think sometimes this is a core tension for, for donors to think about, for individuals that think about themselves as promoting governance or being peace builders is, you know, what, pe what are the, what kind of calculus are elites within these countries using and how do those depart from our Western conceptions of every piece of space needing to be governed in a particular way. So that's sort of the way that I'm thinking about it in the Afghan case. And that has implications for things like counter-narcotics. It has implications uh, for things like reconstruction and, and building out infrastructure and education and all kinds of things. And there's a very tumultuous Afghan history around that as well, which I think we don't, we're not always aware of, that there were many... Afghan rulers themselves who attempted to again conquer the mountains and in most cases it didn't go it didn't go well for them. Very good. Uh, Judith, uh, as you have heard the comments of uh, your colleagues here, any, anything that you want to add from the perspective of, of your own research? And I, I think also, you know, each well, well it, my book tries to draw a continuity between the different regions, I think, you know, what you raise with Afghanistan and also with, with your two case studies in Mexico and Colombia, obviously each case is unique and has its own culture and has its own history. So, you know, while I can see solutions for certain areas, it, they might not be as workable for others. So, yeah. And I think you, you very eloquently pointed that out right there. Okay. Yeah, I, I wonder also if... if Part of the problem is that we always think about the state of something that uh, needs to from the center and go to the periphery and, and, and that the, as if in these areas, in these mountains, in this community, there, there are no tradition, there are no practices, there is no uh, something on which maybe to strengthen, maybe to give it more space, but there is already something that is going on that needs to be uh, nourished and cultivated and expanded, right? Um, as I was listening to you, I just remember the conversation I had uh, once at my uh, home with the mayor of uh, Palermo, Lelu Orlando. so it's an uh, urban area, but uh, he is known for, for uh, having come up with a powerful cultural paradigm in fighting against the, the, the mafia. And, uh, and we were talking about what peace building means for him mm -hmm. as a mayor, and he will say, well, peace building is, is really community building. And, and he was talking, you know, at the end of the day, you need to make these peripheries self-normative uh, communities mm -hmm. so that they themselves regulate uh, the, the lives and, and the values and, and the norms by which they... So he, he said he saw somehow the state, which we, he represented as a, as a mayor, more as facilitating those processes, right, and making sure that community building mechanisms are, are in place, rather than you know, programs that start from the mayor's office or from the state, from the center, and then go and get displaced for a certain period of time. And then when uh, the state changes, when the resources changes, everything passes, right? So community building stays with the territory. And I, since we have a few minutes, I just wonder if, uh, especially Paul, and if you have some, some ideas about uh, that. Because I'm not sure it's always about money or only about you know, uh, sending a lot of money uh, uh, in order to make things uh, mix happen. I, I see certain forms of, or also of crime. You know, I, I don't think we have a real uh, developed social or very little social history of narco-trafficking, for example, in Latin America. We still tend to see as a, only as a criminal phenomenon. But I see it as forms of resistance of, a, of, of certain elites and oligarchies to, you know, to extend their power to certain region and uh, so I, I wonder if, if, if you see community building as part of that autonomy that Judy was talking about. It. I think there's, there's two things. And the first is the idea that communities necessarily need facilitators, need help, etc., from the outside. Um, sometimes, yes, quite often, no. And while anthropologists tend to romanticize remote communities overly, and nevertheless, in Mexico, historically, there have been some relatively stable, quite a lot of relatively stable, relatively low violence highland communities. And the problem actually is contact with the outside world, with capitalism. The problem isn't inherent in resource conflict inside the community. It's the community and the arriving state, both rigging the scheme of business, both starting to charge taxes for what? Well, Nothing all that evident. And then secondly, I think you had a very good point speaking of rhythms. 
it's very easy to have a brief splash of development for a mountain community and it plays well and then it's finished and this is worse than no development at all from a conflict point of view i'll give you two examples and one is sinaloa where you go in you foster um colonization <coughs> you bring communities in inverted commas into the highlands you build some roads so that products can be taken out and then you pull the plug on funding what's left well individual entrepreneurial activity which in this case is not generally approved of and the same happened but to a far greater extent of course in Peru the upper Wayaga Valley half the world's cocaine used to come from there very idealistic colonization scheme tens of thousands of people brought in roads created cooperative sent up plugs pulled you're left with tens of thousands of people with no livelihood but really good roads I mean, one of the things that, when I listened to your comments, Aldo, I was thinking is, I mean, it's important to sort of acknowledge that the periphery or peripheries or even these smaller communities, that they're not monolithic either, right, in terms of their interests and their ambitions. So I think there are... You know, there are certain once, for example, in Afghanistan after 2001, once communities that had been really completely beyond the reach of the state were exposed through the arrival of NGOs and, and all kinds of foreign aid programs to things like access to health care or ideas about education. I mean, in, in the younger generations, for example, there may be a real ambition um, on the part of young people or on the part of women who can now go to school um, to have the state, so-called state, come in and provide those those services that may be, which may be very threatening to other members of the communities that were previously managing questions of marriage or, or conflict resolution or whatever it may be. And I mean, the other thing is that, of course, the elites within these countries also respond to and co-opt these ideas about what the state should be and that the center should reach the periphery. And so they become not just financially invested in, in growing the state, but also there are all sorts of very interesting political oppor and social opportunities that emerge from them that outsiders usually don't understand, leave alone have an ability to control. But I, so I think it, I mean, and in many ways, a lot of the conflict that actually tends to emerge um, has to do with internal fractures that kind of get exposed once these political economies, you know, at a province or in a district get disrupted. And that's, I think that's very challenging because that kind of disruption is inevitable. Um, but it's very, it, it seems very difficult to anticipate what ways it will go, leave alone to kind of manage it, especially um, as an outsider, but even as a central government, as a ministry or as an official, very, very difficult. And so what, what I have seen is that the individuals that seem to do the best in these situations are the kind of brokers and the middlemen that kind of move between, are able to move between high and low or move between center and periphery. And so those are the actors that be, to me become the most interesting to look at because for better or for worse, they are kind of shepherding a lot of this process, right? Excellent. Thank you, Judith Paul and Dipali. And I think we can open it to, uh, to the floor. We have uh, about half an hour and we wanted to give uh, uh, enough space uh, for you to share uh, impressions or ask questions. And there is a microphone here, so that we, since we are also <coughs> recording, smile for the camera and then ask the question. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, this brought to mind uh, our own country's experience with... Uh, Can with, you just introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Gabriel yeah, Curis. Right. I'm from the Center for the Advancement of Public Integrity in uh, the law school. So uh, this discussion brought to mind our own country's experience with um, mountain conflicts. I'm thinking particularly of Appalachia and um, the challenge proposed post our own state formation uh, from the Whiskey Rebellion up through Prohibition. Um, and, you know, I mean, I don't know if you just want to go on to care to comment about, about kind of how it relates to, to American history and even to our own current political conflicts. 
Um, I'm not a great expert on Appalachia. Most of my book was abroad, but without a doubt, it's an area which has been cut off and marginalized. And um, it is coincidentally an area where there were very, very long-standing blood feuds. I think the longest-standing blood feud in U.S. history took place there. But you know, certainly the question of integrating communities or providing resources or making them feel less marginalized is definitely an issue there. And I think we saw that in the last election. Can I just add, add one point on this? I actually have a student who's um, writing a paper for a class of mine on non-state armed actors, and he's writing about militias that are volunteer militias in, on the border, on the U.S.-Mexico border, that are helping the the border patrol to patrol. And he he's told me that you know there are volunteers coming from all over the U.S. to be part of this movement to basically support the border area and. You know, it's it, we ended up having a conversation about I think I think to Gabe's point that there there are real questions in this country, even around the issue of health care, for example. How much is the state to be involved, and how much is it going to dictate things, and how much do what levels of autonomy exist, and you know whether that's overtly around questions of violence, which a militia issue brings up, or just more generally around. What is public and what is private? I think there are a lot of really interesting questions that come up in the states that we tend not to think about because we kind of exoticize what it is to be low and high or center and periphery. But it's very much here as well, it, it seems. Hi, my name is Lydia Cano. I'm a student here. Um, um, I wanted to hear your vision on whether you think that a stronger presence of the state in these uh, peripheral areas would really um, help preventing conflicts, or this is a kind of just the geographical differences make make the differences so systematic that it would really just be. Um, as you were saying, just like better roads or better better infrastructures, but not really, it will really make a difference in, in the dynamics of the conflicts. Thank you. Well, I can give two examples from the book. One chapter is about Nepal, where the presence of the state is actually very negative because there's a an explosion of hydroelectric dam building in the Himalayas at the moment, in the five countries of the Himalayas. And this one community I went to in Nepal, it's an indigenous community called the Rai, and they've been getting along just fine by themselves. Now the Indian and Nepali governments are, are, have signed an agreement to build a high dam that will basically flood out their lands. And they will lose these lands that they've historically held for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. So that would be an example of a negative state interference. The other thing is the blood feuds in Albania. Um, in this very, very isolated part of the country, in the Dineric Ar um, Alps, where the blood feuds have been a form of social justice, um, it worked because it worked there. That was always the way to do things. So you had these series of reprisals where one person killed a guy in, a net, in another family, then somebody in his family had to pay the blood debt, and this would go on and on and on. Eventually, um, the two families would get together, and they would have a public repudiation, a truce called a besa, and it would be public. You know, you'd get together in the Times Square, the whole community be, would be there, and they'd say, okay, we're going to end this. The problem is you can't do that now with modern law. Because if you stand in the town square and you say, we're going to end this after killing each other for six generations, you go to jail. So the modern law and the central law is actually in huge conflict with the ancient law. And it's actually per perpetrating the, the blood feuds because you can't resolve them the way you used to. So I would, I would give those as two examples of negative state intervention. I think historians are very good at saying what's failed in the past and rather than what might work down the line. And what's clear is that military state um, presence is an extremely uphill enterprise which generally fails. Um, there was an old British estimate that you probably needed 10 regular soldiers for every guerrilla to have a any chance of actually imposing some form of peace. Um, if mountain conflicts in Latin America teach us anything at all, 
is that that's probably hopelessly conservative. And trying to find any sort of sustainable peace founded on military occupation or a massively beefed up police presence, um, I thread open the panel, I can't think of a single one. You can have a brief interlude, but lasting, sustainable, overcoming deep-seated economic or political conflict, can't think of any. That just doesn't work. I think that the mountain communities that I'm familiar with take, um, as much as you can generalize, a very instrumental approach, actually, to the state. There's not a sort of immediate Jim Scott type sort of anarcho-liberal blanket rejection, necessarily. There might have been historic rejection because the state's never presented itself in a sort of palatable form. But I think you will get a sort of pick and mix a la carte approach where a lot of mountain communities think, well, okay, sewage doesn't seem that bad. You know, education is very, very, very controversial and you can actually map a state quite often in where there are federal teachers and where there aren't, whether it's in Vietnam in the 60s or Mexico in the 40s. So education is probably not the best place to start in terms of bringing in the state. But basic, pragmatic, instrumentally appreciable benefits, I think the state's quite often very welcome on local terms. Mm. Nepali, you want to yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree, and I think this we've seen in Afghanistan, for example, in the realm of counter-narcotics, that, you know, in the beginning, depending on the price of other crops, the wheat price grows up, then and you're going to get a bunch of, of aid in exchange for not growing poppy. There, there may actually be an amenability to the, to the government coming into these spaces that have otherwise been left f fairly untouched. But... There's a dynamism to that, and at some point, um, and that's where other actors kind of can come into the picture who can offer alternate forms of authority or relief from, from the impositions of the state, and it becomes, I think it becomes very challenging. So it depends on what you mean by strong state. There's, there are moments in which, and, and certain sectors or certain functions, I think, at certain moments in time in which the state may well be welcome. But that doesn't in any way give you a sense of across sectors or across a long period of time what you would expect in terms of, of uh, possible resistance. And I think that's, that's what makes state building like a, a fundamentally a turbulent experience. Um, hi, Christopher Salata. Um, I'm the founder of an organization called the Peace Accelerators and its community. And um, I, one, um, Dr. Paul, um, your answer about beefing up military presence or, or military um, or police states, things, things like that, and how they can lead to more conflict. I, I read Chomsky a lot, and I, I read lots of different peace philosophers, um, Gal Tung, and um, there was a Gallup poll, um, I think in 2013 or 2014, where they polled the entire world, 1,000 people per country, asked which country was the largest obstruction to peace, and kind of unanimously most countries actually um, voted the United States by far as most obstructing peace. Um, so one, I just wanted your guys' thoughts on um, kind of the U.S. role currently on if we're really helping create more peace, or if you think that we're kind of hurting, and then really more, uh, maybe for this room, um, what are some actionable steps um, that maybe we can do to help, um, you know, while we're here to um, prevent some of this um, conflict in, in these areas or, or what we might be able to do in this room um, from this forward, from just in your perspective. Who wants to take this? Your, that's your field. <laughs> Observe what he said, currently, which makes it even more difficult to respond or, or easier. Kidding. You want to start there? No, no, please, Aldo. You, only... <laughs> no, you know, I, I, the, the, only, the only place where, that, where I have observed the presence of the U.S. On, on, uh, is in Colombia. Um, and I think it's a, it's a difficult assessment uh, at the end of the day because today you do have a peace agreement with the, with the FARC. Um, and, you know, several... several um, Analysts do say that you know the beefing up of the military and the technology and the, and the intelligence capability uh, provided by the U.S. to Colombia allowed to come to a point where uh, you know the ripeness was reached for the FARC and the government to sit down at the table. 
What I think is not spoken of enough is the cost of that beefing up the military and of that military strategy mm -hmm. strategies uh, for the communities, um, uh, for the environment, um, but also for, for for the exercise uh, of, of democracy and 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 all of that. So I, I think it has mixed reviews. Um, Plus, really, you know, the, the development in those communities where the counterinsurgency efforts have been uh, focused, in terms of development, really not, not, not big change. You know, the, the community are still facing the challenges that they had when, when they were completely uh, living in territories dominated by the, by the FARC. Um, you know, the U.S. presence in Colombia means also having targeted mostly the South, uh, b because the FARC were framed as a uh, drug cartel, uh, and in the meantime, in the north, in those same years, you know, the spread of the paramilitaries and the right-wing uh, armed groups uh, went almost unchecked and unstopped. And somehow, you know, and I don't want to say directly by the government of the U.S., but certainly by local forces, were e even encouraged, right? Um, which. You know, certainly if, if the efforts in the South would have worked, which didn't, because cocaine actually raised, uh, you know, the field in the last, uh, it, it went down during during the past 10, 10 15 years, but it rose up in the last uh, two, three years uh, significantly. Um, you know, so th that would have been unbalanced by the fact that, you know, even militarily, the, the reading of the dynamics of the conflict were done only through the lenses of, of uh, the fight uh, and the war on drugs. Um, so I think it's, it's a mixed review, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, some programs and some efforts of US aid in helping communities w weren't positive and weren't uh, working, right? Uh, but in general, I think it's the limited, the incapacity of looking at the historic, cultural, comprehensive context of a of a particular situation, the complexity in its all, and having more a systemic, if you want, reading of and of the situation, and therefore wanting to tackling a problem and resolving it, that sometimes brings uh, results that, you know, it, it it causes unintended consequences that could be and can be worse than the cure in itself. Yeah. I'd say that if you looked over the last hundred years in Latin America. Overwhelmingly, an absent U.S. is a welcome U.S. Um, I don't think, though, that that's a global conclusion, because to give a countervailing example, um, the U.S. Um, leadership in the Balkans in the 90s um, was critical in reversing a war of conquest, imposing a deeply flawed peace settlement, but in the light of genocide, a deeply flawed peace settlement is actually quite a welcome one. And if you compare the US's actions in Bosnia in the mid-90s with that of the other sort of actors like the EU, the UN, or the British, you know, the sort of policemen of the world order on at least this occasion comes out looking, you know, something like its own self-presentation. Transpose that to Latin America. Absolutely not. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we might be very well under this current administration seeing the end of American exceptionalism and foreign policy, so, it, or maybe we won't. <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to be there. We've been debating that. But, you know, it, it could change America's role if indeed America stops playing the role that it has been. Um, I mean, I think one of the challenges for for the U.S. as the most most kind of powerful player is that there are. One has to be honest about what were, what are the reasons driving motivating U.S. intervention versus you know what are the consequences or what are the outcomes. So in the Afghan case, um, you know, a number of people that have worked on Afghanistan for a long time will will have to keep reminding that the reason the U.S. went into Afghanistan was not to bring democracy to Afghans or to develop the whole country or to get the center to reach the periphery. It was to go after or particular organizations that had that it deemed responsible for attacks on the homeland. And so I think the tricky part then becomes to really question 
what donors like to call the theories of change or the causal assumptions about if we do this, it will produce that and it will then produce that. And so part of what I was saying about counterinsurgency, but I think one can say this about many different kinds of intervention is I think one of our roles, certainly at a university, is to look at the assumptions behind each piece of the intervention and first be honest about why the intervener is there, but also second think about is there real evidence that this is the way that if, for example, aid is delivered to a particular district, that that will in fact change the attitude of people towards the government in a positive direction? That That's become almost an axiomatic assumption, which I think we actually have to question. How will an inflow of aid, again, which one might think as just at a minimum not harmful, if not beneficial might actually really disrupt the micro political economy of a district or of a province in ways that may actually produce more conflict than less conflict. Or as Aldo was saying, create expectations uh, that then create conflict when that, when that intervention is over. Um, so that I think is something that actually we in quote civil society, we, we have the capacity to do, to think about it. And in this moment, which for many of us is very frightening in terms of thinking about the US role in the world, the one, I think it, it does provide an opportunity to really go back to the drawing board and think about these things because it's certainly clear that we're at some moment of disruption, not clear exactly where, where it will go. But I think that is a responsibility that we have, which is why a panel like this and a larger conversation like this is important. Uh, Jim Dingman, uh, I want to sort of push on what DePauli was saying. You know, ye uh, yesterday or this week, Frontline did a very powerful hour documentary on the Shia militias. And I've been uh, giving lectures on the Trump defense policy now for four months. And I followed very closely Mosul. Many years ago, I was a journalist in Iraq in, during the Gulf War. Uh, and I want to ask you, you know, what models do we have for successful peacekeeping at this point? Because when one reads about the accounts of the fighting going on in Mosul, there seems to be absolutely a complete breakdown about what to put in place afterwards. Uh, 225,000 refugees, uh, you know, the Shia militia coming in, they didn't want them to come in there because they were going to essentially engage in sectarian violence, which of course they, they do. I mean, what models do we have to get beyond sort of a depressing, you know, feeling about we're in the age of Trump, but we'll get through the age of Trump. What do you see as a positive thing that can happen now? You know, because they're going to fail with what's going on right now. If they continue this, we're going to have a morphing of the remnants of ISIS into something new if this continues. So what do you see are sort of positive things with peacekeeping that can be implied or put forward in the next 10 years as ideas to be implemented in terms of policy? Do you have any thoughts? Well, I don't teach the subject. I only report on it. Okay. <laughs> Jim likes to ask the hard questions that nobody can answer. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, there are positive examples of peacekeeping, but they're not necessarily applicable to Iraq. I mean, look at Namibia. You know, you had two sides that really, they want, and Mozambique, they were tired of fighting, and there was political will. I don't think we have that in Iraq. And again, you know, I think every case has to be taken in its own, in its own context. Will Colombia succeed? We don't know. Maybe that will be a case. But again, would it be applicable to Iraq? No. It wouldn't be. Is Namibia not working? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but Mozambique was internal. Right. Right. And that's my point. I mean, you, a, a solution might work in one place, but it won't necessarily work in the other because you have different factors at play. Graciana, because you spoke, I actually, Graciana Castillo, no, no, why not? Uh, I would like to take advantage, if you don't mind, of, of your presence, because as a scholar and as a practitioner in Peru and then in Afghanistan for the past decade, you, you have been looking at these issues uh, also from a policy-making point of view, and, and I was wondering if you, uh, if you can, David Maino, and, and tell us, share us your thoughts about high and low center and periphery. Thank you, Aldo. I, I found the panel very interesting. 
And one of the things I got from the panel is I haven't been thinking in terms of mountains, but obviously many of the conflicts involve mountains. And Judith said two things that the two examples she mentioned are examples where the auton autonomy went hand in hand with more government or, or resources or whatever you call it. And Aldo said, money is not all. I know money is not all, but it's a very important part. I mean, it's very hard. The two cases you mentioned of all the kilometers of, of places you visited, they are two very rich countries. In one, ca in one case, the European Union invested in infrastructure largely, yeah. and that's why the Basque provinces are so profitable, to, are so um, in such a good economic shape today, and that obviously has been a big deterrent. I mean, if people invest, they don't want to go to, back right. to war, and especially if they're profitable. And the other case was Switzerland, which had its own resources. <laughs> now, Paul, Paul mentioned a, <coughs> a Sinaloa, I think, and the drug issue. And the same in Afghanistan. There are places where the drug and all the activity related, the spill-offs from the drug trade, that is as if you had money, mm -hmm. because that spills into the overall economy. But there are other places that they have no resources whatsoever. So I think, the, and, and this is something we were talking with Aldo today. I've been in, in uh, Colombia almost every year, uh, talking to uh, groups of uh, investors, and um, last time with the, with the defense ministry. And <clears throat> basically, the private sector in Colombia is not willing to pay the cost of the peace. <clears throat> they have not suffered the cost of the war very much because the war has been localized in these places we've been talking about and it hasn't affected them uh, personally. So they are not willing to pay the, the cost of peace in terms of creating employment for the FARCs and all that. And that, in my view, that's going to be a major pro problem because um, unless, I mean, the experience of 25 years, in fact, I just today I got my new book on that, where I analyzed 21 UN operations, multidisciplinary operations, and so to the question, do peacekeeping works? Mm -hmm. I mean, peacekeeping, one thing is peacekeeping in the security sense. The other is peacekeeping in the peace building sense, combining military and civilian. That's much more difficult, and the challenges are tremendous. So, but, but basically, if there is no reintegration of former combatants and there is no national reconciliation, both <coughs> things require a lot of resources because you have to create jobs and you have to create services. And what we see is that insertion groups more and more recruit um, sympathizers or, or through pro the provision of jobs and services that gov governments are unable to provide. So this is where we should focus on. What are we giving in exchange for people leaving up arms and to make sure that these groups don't keep recruiting people who are unhappy with the services and the lack of jobs that the government mm -hmm. uh, provides. And, and join many of which in Afghanistan, for instance, they join the Taliban and other uh, extremists just because they don't have any other option. Sorry, yeah. So it doesn't bode very well for Iraq then. <laughs> mm. Thank you, thank you. Any, any other comment or last question? Otherwise, I'm really proud to say that we kept it on time and on schedule. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Judith Hall and Kipali. And enjoy the rest of the forum.